Uh, Mike Gilson, I'm uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm a co-director with Thomas Herman of the University of California San Diego Center for Drug Discovery Innovation, and also on the site. PI for the University of California Drug Discovery Consortium, which brings together UCSD with UC San Francisco, UCLA, UC Davis, and UC Irvine to foster drug discovery projects and advance uh, discoveries to therapeutics across the five campuses and ultimately across uh, more of the campuses. So today I'm delighted to welcome you all to this inaugural Drug Hunter Award Seminar uh, this was established by the law firm of Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati, or WSGR. Uh, WSGR has provided legal services to some of the best known and most innovative venture-backed startups in the biotech industry, including local companies such as Abide Therapeutics, Vividian Therapeutics, Kinetics Pharmaceuticals, Metacrine Therapeutics, and Fount Therapeutics. In the course of these efforts, WSGR interacted with many scientists who are involved in developing new drugs, and they've established uh, now the Drug Hunter Award to recognize some of the most significant contributors to bringing new drugs to the market. The inaugural recipient to the Drug Hunter Award is Dr. Stephen Caldor. Dr. Caldor uh, received his bachelor's in chemistry from Columbia University and his PhD in organic chemistry from Harvard. He currently serves as a chief executive officer of Fount Therapeutics. And uh, Dr. Michael Hostetler of WSGR will introduce Stephen and present the award on behalf of WSGR. Thanks so much, Mike. Really appreciate that. First, I want to say how pleased we are not only to present this award, but also to be holding this lecture in partnership with UCSD's Center for Drug Discovery Innovation and the multi-campus UC Drug Discovery Consortium. Couldn't really imagine a better place to have a Drug Hunter Award than at, at a place like this. You know, we're really enthusiastic about your efforts here to, to build drug discovery research at the UCs and to connect this work with industrial partners, of course, which is certainly essential to move academic discoveries from the lab to the bedside. So what is a drug hunter? The way I look at it and the way we've looked at it, it's really someone who has an uncanny knack for identifying and developing new therapies. And Steve Caldor really fits that description. Steve has over 25 years of experience in biotech and pharmaceutical industries. and was involved in the discovery of multiple launch drugs, very impressive, including the antiretroviral anti Viracept and the anti-diabetic Nacina. For his numerous contributions, he was selected to receive the first Drug Hunter Award. In honor of Steve's contributions to drug development, WSGR is going to donate $1,000 to the charities chosen by Dr. Caldor. Uh, Steve chose to split the donation between two groups that are probably relevant to this audience. Uh, that is, groups that promote chemical education. That is, the American Chemical Society's Project SEED and the Advanced Chemistry Teachers Program. Finally, I'm really happy, uh, Steve, to present you with this uh, award, uh, the Drug Hunter Award, and uh, really appreciate all the, the great work that you've done. Thanks very much. Thanks. So we'll switch to this mic now, please. We good? Can you hear me? Yep. All right, very good. So um, I'm excited to be here delivering this inaugural Drug Hunter seminar, and I hope it to be the first of many I really want to thank the organizers for their efforts to put this series together. And I hope to do it honor uh, to convince you by the end of this uh, that I'm perhaps uh, starting to be a drug hunter. It's a journey, right? The title of my lecture is uh, Creating Value in California Biotech. Now, what I'd like to achieve in this lecture is shown here on this slide. I'd like to share lessons from actually now 27 years, I can't believe it, uh, in the pharma and biotech industry through several personal case studies. And to be clear, I'm gonna share uh, what uh, is called in the Midwest where I was born, uh, some of the making the sausage, the part that people don't like to share, as well as some of the real victories, all right? To try and give you a balanced uh, uh, perspective on this, uh, this industry, which I love, all right? Uh, I'm going to talk about my uh, work at Lilly, uh, along with my teammates there at Cirix, at Quanacell, and then last but not least at Fount Therapeutics, uh, a company I've created recently. My hope is that these lessons are evade to audience members that are interested in creating what I would term true biotech value. 
And I have a particular definition of biotech value. Um, the way I, I measure success for myself personally is in terms of marketed drugs that make a true difference to patients, the waiting patient, and in terms of building a stronger biotech ecosystem. So um, uh, a, a little bit on my past, just to give you a feel for um, where I come from. Uh, as I said, I've had uh, a bit over 27 years in industry, and I've worked for multiple companies. Um, uh, I started out as a medicinal chemist, and I still do drug design. Just, you know, one of the reasons I moved from large pharma to biotech is because little companies allow me to do many things, including actually still doing drug design, uh, uh, being a scientist, uh, while still being in other operating roles. Um, um, at least they tolerate me uh, as a CEO doing these things. I've also, in addition to operating roles, had a number of advisory roles on uh, boards of directors, SABs, or as a strategic advisor for a variety of companies, some of which you may know here. Um, um, there are three marketed drugs that I've been tightly associated with and another over 10 compounds that have gone into human clinical trials. I hope at least a subset of those do progress to clinic with time. Um, you know, so as I said, in terms of value creation, I measure it in terms of marketed drugs that make a difference for patients, and also in terms of job cre creation and mentoring. Um, um, and then, uh, and that there's some metrics uh, shown here. Uh, the money flows if you do the first two, all right, um, um, and, and it's flowed well well for the shareholders, including the employees and founders of the companies I've been affiliated with through um, six uh, acquisitions and three initial public offerings. Actually, um, uh, Crenetics was mentioned, and I've got a, a shout out to them because just this last week they went public. And a number of my friends, these are a lot of ex-neurocrine uh, uh, employees, uh, birthed that from scratch, uh, bootstrapped for a number of years, uh, received Series A financing, that's when I joined them, and have just gone public. And, uh, uh, I hope they're a long-term San Diego success uh, story. I'm rooting for them, as well as the whole California ecosystem of biotech. So the first case study I wanted to present is on Lilly and Agaron and their efforts to produce a, a marketed drug called Virocept. And I have to take you back in the way back machine, at least for, uh, for, for me it feels like a way, way back, all right? Uh, maybe s most of you were born by then, maybe not all of you, all right? And so uh, what, was, what was happening with AIDS at this time? Um, well, I picked two covers from Time Magazine uh, along with a, a poignant photograph to give you a feel for the level of crisis uh, at the time. And so um, this was a global uh, and growing pandemic at the time. Uh, there were very few launch drugs. There were a few nucleoside analogs that were showing some very limited benefit, but patients were honestly dying left and right. It was a death sentence for people. Um, no effective treatments. Uh, the virus was rapidly mutating and uh, conferring resistance to monotherapies. Um, however, there was hope. There was recent basic fundamental science to show which uh, uh, proteins within uh, the AIDS virus were essential for replication. And there was a hypothesis that perhaps if one could develop uh, drugs that targeted multiple Achilles heels of the virus, one could develop a drug cocktail that could be more effective against uh, uh, AIDS. All right? So that, that was the story at the time. And this was the time when I joined Lilly. It was in 1990 as a naive, uh, non-industry person coming straight out of school, trying to make a difference in my own little way. Um, so uh, one of those targets that was of interest was called HIV protease. It's an interesting uh, target. It's actually beautiful in some ways. Um, it's a C2 symmetric homodimer. It's a serine protease, or actually a spartal protease, my apologies. It preferentially cleaves uh, phenylalanine pro proline residues. And um, uh, you know, it was, a, in essence, at least a, a validated target to a certain extent um, at the time. The competitive landscape for this target is shown here. At the time um, I started work on this target at Lilly, um, along with Aguron, um, Lilly and Aguron. Aguron was a small biotech, San Diego-based uh, biotech. And uh, Lilly had struck a collaboration with Aguron that was broad reaching with the notion of learning uh, structure-based drug discovery from an early pioneer in this space, along with Vertex and a few others. They were the pioneers in this area. Uh, and so they entered into a collaboration to look at both virus, virology targets and cancer targets. 
and HIV proteus was one of these targets, and I was assigned to work on uh, this target. Um, it was very pleasant coming out to San Diego in, in January in the middle of snowstorms in Indianapolis, and uh, it, it, it lodged a, a, a thought in my head that maybe eventually I might want to come out here. So anyway, the competitive landscape, the, the known inhibitors uh, were potent, uh, were selective, but really had poor drug properties. They were heavily peptidic, they were high molecular weight, and they really didn't have legs to be meaningful drugs. Um, some of these were pushed in uh, uh, even by IV routes to try and uh, desperately help patients, uh, but they were tragically flawed. So uh, we thought, could we possibly use structure-based drug discovery to um, enhance the drug characteristics of known leads? Reducing their peptidic nature and molecular weight um, was the hypothesis to enhance oral bioavailability and other drug characteristics. And honestly, at this time, I don't think the Pfizer rule of five, Lipinski rules, or anything had really been quite fully fleshed out. So it was a, a little bit of more of a vague hypothesis. We were groping slightly in the dark, maybe with a dim light that perhaps this could work. I'm not going to give a chemistry seminar here, but I, I pulled a few slides from some of my publications and some of uh, my Agaron colleagues' publications to give you a feel for the techniques we pursued using structure-based design. And so to reduce peptidic nature, just as an example here, uh, we, we came up with the notion of uh, uh, eliminating uh, proline residues and putting in uh, ortho-substituted benzamides um, uh, as replacements. And the first compounds we made here actually turned out to be uh, uh, single-digit nanomolar inhibitors of the target per design, but these did not confer uh, oral bioavailability. Uh, st still issues with that. Second thing we noticed is that these inhibitors uh, bound in an extended beta sheet to the enzyme. And so it became logical to look at um, spanning between uh, P1 and P3 pockets of the target, looking at truncation strategies where you could reduce the P3 residue and expand out the P1 residue and perhaps even eventually get rid of some amide bonds. And we achieved this, as is shown in the blue and the yellow structures. Um, uh, these are crystal, co-crystal structures with HIV protease in a superposition to show uh, those designs worked. And some of these were actually picomolar inhibitors of the target. Still no oral bioavailability. Uh, we were pounding our head against the wall. What finally produced a breakthrough was changing the um, uh, P2 site, site binder to um, an isothalic uh, acid uh, derivative or an isothalamid. Uh, this pocket binds both valine and asparagine. And so we elected to come up with more valine-like mimics um, um, that were non-peptidic. And by also introducing some uh, salt-forming handles on these inhibitors, we had our first oral bioavailability breakthrough. Um, our friends at Agron were working collaboratively with us. And they had the logical thought of combining the lipophilic um, 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 uh, benzamide functionality with a polar substituent that would mimic the asparagine uh, polar uh, element. And, yeah, yes. Yeah, sure. and, um, and so we, um, uh, this resulted in another breakthrough in reducing molecular weight while maintaining potency. Um, but still, some of these compounds were not particularly orally absorbed. What we finally found is through a combination of a variety of SAR efforts, that by adding back a salt-forming handle in the form of uh, uh, actually Hoffman LaRoche's uh, uh, um, uh, bicyclic uh, amine here, along with a P13 spanner and a truncated P2 group, um, we could achieve compounds with very good oral bioavailability and drug characteristics. And compound 11A, which is LY312857, AG1343, nilfinavir, and now um, um, uh, Virusept uh, uh, um, was, was, was birthed. This compound proved to show reasonable oral bioavailability in multiple animal species. It wasn't amenable to once a day dosing. In fact, I think the, uh, uh, the patient regimen involved three times a day dosing, but at least it was viable um, as part of a cocktail regimen. In the, in the animal that matters, this was in healthy volunteers. Um, this compound showed a, a good PK as well. And so as a result, um, the molecule that became Virusep was advanced further in the clinic and was launched as a drug in early uh, 1997. 
Now, going from the start of the project, first laboratory experiment to FDA approval in a little bit over uh, seven years is very good. Um, I don't know if you know the industry benchmarks, but it's more like 12 years to accomplish this. And so while it felt like a slog to me at the time, it was actually miraculously fast. Um, in the midst of this, the competition, or perhaps the people trying to help the AIDS patients together with us, depending on your perspective, also had breakthroughs in producing orally bioavailable protease inhibitors. And so not only was uh, nilfinavir slash virusep launched, but also Roche's compound Abbott's and Merck's launched around the same time. It turned out that virusep had some unique characteristics, for example, in terms of uh, combating resistance and ended up capturing um, number one in market share within a few years of launch. And this is a, a Time uh, magazine cover from uh, a little later, about a decade later, showing uh, that at least for the patients uh, that could access these therapies, uh, improvements uh, in uh, their lifespans. Uh, and not only celebrities like Magic Johnson took uh, triple cocktails, including uh, Virusep, but also less well-known but equally important uh, people uh, have been able to survive using uh, this uh, regimen. Now, since then, Virusept has been supplanted by more effective therapies. Uh, life goes on, um, and uh, that's a good thing. Um, but it was exciting. This was the very first project I worked on that resulted in a marketed drug. That's uh, miraculous. Uh, I'm grateful for that experience. Now, I wanted to tell you, remember, a little bit about the sausage piece, all right? So what's the rest of the story behind this drug, all right? And so one, one thing I wanted to share with you is Lily, where I was working, exited AIDS research, probably six months after Virusept was made. And they, they made a decision to focus their resources on another therapeutic area, neuroscience. They had just launched Prozac. They, uh, a few years later, uh, launched the schizophrenia agent uh, Zyprexa, which became a multi-billion dollar effective treatment for schizophrenia. And uh, in essence, the patent rights were returned to Agaron because they weren't going to progress it. I actually signed off on the patent rights to give it back to Agaron formally. And this is the uncashed check I still have in my possession for $1 for assigning patent rights of uh, this, uh, this drug uh, back to, to Agaron. Now, Agaron did a brilliant job of developing uh, this drug, probably better, frankly, than Lilly would have done. They embraced the AIDS activists. Um, and um, uh, the FDA was fully supportive of trying to pull these drugs through. The FDA can get a bad name. They were trying to help. And they did in this case. And they had uh, uh, other sources of funding from uh, Japan Tobacco, believe it or not, and Roche that helped pull this drug through. Agron was acquired by Warner Lambert in 1999 for $2.1 billion. And a year later, Pfizer acquired um, um, uh, Warner Lambert mainly for Lipitor, but also for this drug. And so for those of you who don't know, the current Pfizer San Diego site has its roots in, um, in Agaron and indeed in Virusept. And there are about 1,000 people working away there. Um, and so um, you know, I, to me, that's, uh, there's a launch drug, and there's high value jobs here locally. Uh, I view this as a, a success. So the second uh, case study I wanted to present to takes us forward to 2002. Um, and this is work be between Cirrix, uh, PPD, and Takeda to discover and launch two drugs, um, both diabetes agents, Nasina and Zafatec. So uh, I, had the, I heard the siren call of biotech and decided it was time for me to leave Eli Lilly. I wanted to come to a biotech hub as well. Lilly's a little bit of a lonely place in Indianapolis when it comes to um, options. And I wanted to go to a smaller enterprise. Uh, uh, I think the exposure to Agaron had something to do with that. And you know, if I were to pick a hub, San Diego looked pretty good relative to the Bay Area or Boston to me. And so uh, the people making that siren call were Peter Schultz, Sam Colella from Versant Ventures, Wendell Waringa, who's a pharma executive who'd moved to run um, Cyrix, Ned David, who was a younger uh, founder, and Ray Stevens, uh, I believe at TSRI at the time, uh, a co-founder of uh, Cyrix. And this was meant to be a second generation structure-based drug discovery company to try and um, pursue structural pro proteomics to make drugs. And uh, yeah, this was the gist of the pitch on Cyrix. 
you know, going from genome to drugs is a big leap. People were failing at it at the time. The notion of inserting structural proteomics to actually start to get closer to drugs in a parallel processing manner from the genome was viewed as appealing. And a number of structural proteomics companies were launched at the time, such as SGX locally, um, Affinium, um, uh, Cyrix, and others. Perhaps still naive, honestly, but that was the thought, that this would be the bridge to drugs. Uh, when I interviewed for uh, the job, I was fascinated by the technologies that had, been, that had come out of TSRI and actually the Novartis Institute locally to help uh, birth um, Cyrix. And these were functioning uh, and patented high-throughput structural biology technology that enabled uh, things like nanoscale crystallization experiments and the solution of many, many, many structures in parallel. In fact, I believe, honestly, Cyrix built the world's structural biology capacity within one roof. It was that impressive. The question was, um, how could that be tasked for drug discovery? And here's a pretty picture showing uh, some of the uh, de novo crystal structures, to be clear. These were first in the world crystal structures for new human or prokaryotic proteins. And there were hundreds produced. Um, uh, and honestly, it was trivial to get to complexes. That's easy once you have a de novo structure. The business model for Cyrix uh, looked good. Uh, and when I joined, I thought, this looked like a pretty good system for producing a long-lasting company. The notion was to sell excess capacity in structural biology to partners, to plow the profits from that into building a drug discovery uh, enterprise uh, in a serial manner, and then uh, eventually to get to the point where we're selling uh, uh, drug candidates um, and the like in 04. And in fact, Cirix did a number of deals to validate this approach before the biotech bubble burst. And then this didn't work anymore. So this hypothesis um, ended up being flawed, uh, forced by a biotech bubble burst. Um, and red has shown what, what happened. Um, uh, the business did not materialize. It wasn't profitable to the extent we were doing the work. Um, uh, we were caught without having built, in fact, this predates me, but caught without having built cross-functional drug discovery. And so we had the right, wrong talent on board to, to, to build a company. Um, and then the uh, structural proteomics approach wasn't working. And so the, the small fledgling drug discovery efforts were uh, not moving quickly. These were poorly validated targets, and it was a tough road to hoe. So the question is what to do. And very, very painful things happen. And realize this is me coming out of maybe the safe womb, I thought, at the time of large pharma and diving into biotech. And within months, the bubble burst. This was not what I planned for, right? So what we underwent was a huge uh, reduction in force from 140 employees down to 75. Brutal. Uh, we subleased the building and did other cost-saving measures because we were running out of money. We couldn't pay people. Um, it was very clear that the structural biology service deals were actually hurting us, and we were uh, reserving uh, precious capacity for a, a loss leader. And so uh, we pivoted to bet the farm on drug discovery at this point. And uh, we figured we better pick some targets that actually could yield fruit quickly. Um, and so we elected to bet at least for a subset of our portfolio on what I would call highly validated targets and a more of a fast follower approach. And this is simple pragmatics to, to survive, honestly. So this is a slide I built within a month of joining the company. And by the way, in the midst of this, most of the officers in the company had left and I was asked to run the company. Welcome to biotech. Um, not what I'd signed up for. I thought I was going to be a CSO. Um, and I did that too. Um, so the, the remaining team, uh, what we did is uh, we came up with these goals that we would go from first touch of a target to the clinic in 36 months or less, and that the majority of the targets we worked on would result in a compound that went into man. And I don't know if you fully appreciate it, but those are very ambitious goals. 
And we looked very hard at our sources of potential efficiency. And we concluded the structure-based technologies were indeed enabling. By this time, we'd done the pivot to at least bring, build in a small fledgling group of seasoned drug hunters. And then the question became, what was the focus portfolio strategy we would use to complement this? And I've already hinted at elements of that. So the team we did bring in, uh, uh, by design, had uh, ample structure-based drug discovery experience. And they'd produced over 50 clinical candidates. So they were certified. They had particular expertise in kinase and protease and NHR drug discovery. Uh, there was depth in oncology and metabolic diseases in particular. And we wanted to harness this. From a target validation state, um, we elected to focus at this point on high validation state targets. And I'll admit this was a bias I had at Lilly that I carried with me into um, Cirix. And I don't know if you fully appreciate this, but I, I did analyses on this at Lilly before I left. And over 70% of all marketed drugs result from R&D efforts on a previously clinically validated target. So to be clear, at the time the research is initiated, that target's already been clinically validated. And so the odds, of course, are higher if you play this game. The question is, can you still produce innovation and market value and still be timely? So we thought that perhaps we could find targets where there was clinical validation, but there was a tragically flawed drug that wouldn't make it to launch. And we could quickly follow behind uh, to produce either a first-in-class or a best-in-class agent. So this became the basis for our strategy, our portfolio strategy. And I'm emphasizing this because this is incredibly important as you choose what to work on. And it, this can vary from company to company. But for Cirix, this became clear that this was the appropriate near-term strategy. So we picked the therapeutic areas shown here, um, the validation state I've alluded to, applicability of structure-based drug discovery. We decided we wanted to pick targets for which no one in the world had solved the structure, but were clinically validated to give us a competitive advantage to use structure-based drug discovery. We decided that the uh, targets needed to be ones where it could support multiple launch drugs. We may not get there first, but we could be best, or we could um, coexist with another marketed drug and be successful. And then furthermore, we wanted to work in gene superfamilies where the, the chemistry and even the biology was reusable so that we would have a leg up for the next project we started against a related target. So with this in mind, it's a long prelude to why we picked dipeptyl peptidase 4 as our top priority drug discovery project. And this occurred within about six weeks of me joining the company that we said, this is where we're going to put our primary bet. All right? And this was risky, all right? but this is what we elected to do. So this checked all the boxes, metabolic disease, clinically validated. Uh, we actually had crystals of this target um, growing, and we thought we could solve it. And as far as we could tell, no one else had solved the structure yet. The market size and potential was enormous. And there was reuse potential for this now serine protease. There were actually related members of the family we thought we might be able to drug and do more pioneering work on later. A little bit of biology here. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about GLP-1. And there's a San Diego story, obviously, here associated with GLP-1. So GLP-1 is a peptide um, uh, released from the gut following meals. And it has profound positive effects, all right, um, as listed here, all right? And around 2002, when we started this project, companies such as Amelin locally here, who's now been acquired by Bristol-Myers Squibb, had been doing clinical work on stable uh, uh, GLP-1 analogs, actually from Gila monster venom, interestingly, um, and shown that they were efficacious uh, by injection. And in fact, several of these uh, drugs have since launched and have become billion or multi-billion dollar products. It turns out DPP-4 uh, cleaves GLP-1. And so the thought is if one could come up with a orally bioavailable DPP-4 inhibitor, one could, in essence, indirectly uh, modulate levels of GLP-1 in the body and have an oral uh, agent that uh, had a positive effect on diabetics. Now, what was even more tantalizing to us as we looked at the competitive landscape is that this had been validated with some small molecules that were tragically flawed. So these compounds, uh, for reasons I won't elaborate on, didn't have legs to get into launch. But uh, both Novartis and actually ProBioDrug had demonstrated proof of principle in the clinic. And so we thought, let's fire on all cylinders and produce a drug. Let's go, team. So we used our technologies to indeed solve, I believe, the first in the world, or one of the first in the world structures of DPP-4. 
and then leveraged this for lead generation. And we used a variety of lead generation techniques, de novo design, fragment-based uh, um, lead generation. Uh, we used known inhibitors as well. And we developed what I would call a composite pharmacophore, which we then leveraged to do um, further iterative design, including scaffold morphing. And this is an example of one of those experiments. There's the composite pharmacophore we built based on complexes. And within eight weeks of doing this, we uh, designed, synthesized, tested, and crystallized um, our first compound, which was a 10 nanomolar inhibitor of the target. It was very efficient. Here's the overall discovery story for the DPP-4 program. And on the uh, y-axis is number of complexes, and on the uh, x-axis is time. And you'll note that um, very quickly we went to proprietary inhibitors, and within months we had compounds with complete oral bioavailability. And uh, we chose actually three clinical candidates in parallel. We couldn't afford to uh, slip up and slow down, um, so attrition was not acceptable. And so we parallel processed multiple lead series into the clinic. Uh, we actually prosecuted a total of 14 different chemical uh, classes, 10 of which were novel in this program. This just froze up for some reason. There we go. And so this is the concept of managing attrition um, through some uh, chemical diversity. 10 series of proprietary DPP-4 hits and four series of leads were prosecuted in parallel. These are some chemical structures, some exemplars of the different series. You can see they're actually quite structurally diverse. All had quite good oral bioavailability. And multiple of these compounds were progressed into IND enabling studies. The winner out of these turned out to be SEER322, which later became termed allogliptin or nisina. And these are some of the development candidate characteristics of this compound. Um, I'm not going to read this uh, eye chart to you, but suffice to say this had excellent drug properties and looked to have the makings of a best-in-class or perhaps even a first-in-class uh, uh, DPP-4 inhibitor. But while we built research in this company, we hadn't built development. So the question was how we're we going to take these compounds into the clinic. And we looked at a variety of options. And what we eventually elected to do is partner with a CRO called PPD, which is a world expert in clinical development. And we did a, what at the time was a creative deal, uh, which allowed for funding of this program by PPD through to end phase two, and where we split the value with them 50-50 uh, in terms of profit sharing. Realized we had about no money at this time, all right? So that was a constraint. We chose to partner with PPD for a variety of reasons. First and foremost, it was their world-class development expertise, along with their commitment to parallel process multiple compounds through preclinical development and into the clinic. They also offered competitive financials. Other people were interested in this program but wanted to own it wholly. And um, uh, we felt that the ownership structure allowed options for us in terms of IPO or uh, M&A. Uh, we were rewarded for taking this bet with PPD and that they, along with us, uh, produced some beautiful clinical data. This is phase one data, and this is textbook in terms of dose linearity for uh, oral, oral uh, bioavailability. What was at least as exciting as this was the PD results. So this is ex vivo PD results, showing that even at a 25 mg uh, single dose per day, we were suppressing the target enzyme at, uh, at levels sufficient uh, for a drug. So on the basis of this, uh, we had a number of suitors pursue us for acquisition, including Takeda. And we eventually chose Takeda as the successful uh, uh, bidder based on the following uh, rationale. First off, the strength of their diabetes franchise. Uh, they had a TZD called pioglitazone, which was a multi-billion dollar drug, and they were committed to diabetes. And they knew how to develop diabetes drugs. They had interest in the Cerex por portfolio beyond allogliptin. We had multiple other cancer and diabetes programs ongoing. They had a desire to leverage our technologies globally, uh, and the scientists were excited about having that reach. And they had a long-term commitment. They promised me personally, the COO, that they would grow the site as an important long-term 
research site for Takeda. And in, indeed, is the first US research site in its 240 year history. I mean, uh, Takeda's history predates the United States being formed. Pretty amazing. And the financials were competitive. And there was much rejoicing, to use a Monty Python term. And so this is a picture on the acquisition announcement of the team. Um, um, I think we had about, I don't know what the number was, but you know, 70 or 80 folks at the time. Uh, the drug candidate was then advanced into phase two and phase three studies. And these are just data from the phase three study that supported um, NDA submission, showing that uh, in diabetics, indeed, this robustly reduced hemoglobin A1C, either as a single agent or in combination with other diabetes drugs. And so the drug was uh, launched in 2010. It, interestingly, first, uh, first country launch was in Japan. So overall timeline gene to NDA submission was 67 months, uh, which is very good. Um, and parallel processing of multiple leads uh, were used to manage attrition. The other side benefit of progressing multiple candidates into the clinic was that we got a second launch drug out of this effort. That was Trilagliptin, uh, uh, or Zafatec, which is the first approved weekly DPP-4 inhibitor. We'd so optimized the PK of these compounds that we actually had some that were amenable to once a week dosing. And so uh, this was particularly interested, interesting for people in Asia, such as Japan, that don't like pill burden. And so that was launched as the first weekly DPP-4 inhibitor. Um, so uh, again, in terms of value creation, two launch drugs, um, and then job creation. Let's talk about that. Um, so Cirix is now Takeda, California, located here in San Diego, 240 employees. It's grown from the 80 or so at acquisition. It continues to this day to advance uh, the, the, a, a drug portfolio and multiple platforms as an integral part of um, Takeda's uh, research operation. The third um, case study I'd like to present is even closer uh, to the present. This involves Quanacell and cell gene and dates from um, roughly 2009, 2010 to about, at least in terms of my involvement, to 2015. And I can't do a full disclosure here um, because uh, some of the information is just not in the public domain yet. So forgive me for uh, not being able to describe all the science. In the next year, a lot of this will come out in terms of the clinical phase compounds. So um, what were the founding principles for Quanacell? Uh, uh, it related to uh, cancer stem cells. And uh, the hypothesis is that there were a subset of cells within uh, cancer, so-called tumor-initiating cells, really a minor population of the tumor as a whole, that were responsible for maintaining growth and expansion of a cancer. Maybe these were the resistant cells that rebirthed the tumor, for example, uh, on chemotherapy treatment. And the hypothesis was that by understanding um, this heterogeneity of cells within a tumor, at the single cell level, uh, uh, one could uh, enable novel target identification, uh, biomarker development, and more effective chemotherapeutics. And so a VC firm called Versant Ventures, which I've advised for well over a decade, and was an investor in two other companies, Cirix and Ambrix, that I led, um, elected to place a bet on this. This was technology out of um, Stanford University. And the technology pioneers here uh, in academia were uh, Steve Quake, a serial entrepreneur who's created Fluidime and multiple other companies, and Mike Clark, who was a bit of a newbie to biotech, but was uh, uh, an academic leader in cancer stem cell uh, biology. In fact, uh, uh, identifying cancer cells, stem cells for the first time in uh, various tumor types. And these guys had collaborated at Stanford to produce some tools and technologies to allow for single cell analysis and study of tumor heterogeneity. And they wanted to create a company. Now, it's hard to believe in the face of a biotech boom, but, um, you know, boom and bust occurs. And I talked with you about how this happened uh, to me personally at uh, Cirix in 2002. And it was happening again around this time. It was not an easy time. Um, there was another uh, uh, bust, if you will, that occurred as uh, people were thinking about how to create this company. 
And uh, not a lot of money was going into what I would call cutting edge, bleeding edge science. And this was definitely uh, an academic platform with nothing else attached to it. And the question was how to fund this. Fortunately, Versant was willing to put in you know, maybe a million or so dollars. That's viewed as seed financing in biotech to at least do some fledgling efforts. But the question was where was the big money going to come from to really bring this to fruition? So this is just giving a feel for the seeding experiments were done on relatively little money. Uh, my friend Jeff Stafford, who'd worked with me at Cirix, actually directed to Versant. He wanted to start a company. And he became enamored with this technology and became the first employee of uh, uh, Quantacell, which is what it became termed. A, a scientist working in Clark and Quake's labs became the second employee, Rob Cho, um, as a, a bridge into the technology and allowed to allow for tech transfer into the company. And uh, I also joined a little bit later. And so it was really three employees vir working virtually. Uh, we had an engineer to work in his uh, bedroom. I think that picture at the bottom is uh, of him um, building a second generation version of the cell picker. And in the midst of this, we tried to look at doing a deal with pharma as a way to access non-dilutive capital and build a company. And Celgene uh, became intrigued with the uh, science and the fledgling group involved, and conversations continued there, eventually resulting in a, um, a deal with Celgene along with a robust, unsyndicated Versant financing. And so in this relatively tough fundraising time, we were able to architect a deal as shown here. Uh, it actually received recognition as the deal of the year in 2011 by In Vivo magazine. It's pretty creative, which was a prearranged marriage. That's the simple way to put it. The notion was that Celgene would pump uh, $45 million into the company, the vast majority non-dilutive. In return for that, they would have an exclusive option to acquire the company uh, three and a half years later. As an aside, if they did not exercise that option, the company walked away with everything and could do a deal with another party. And uh, you know, God bless them for taking this risk for us in a tough time. And uh, you know, Tom Daniel and George Golombeski from Celgene were the architects of that, and Sam Kalola and Brad Bolzen uh, were uh, the, the, the venture folks that helped us with this deal. So with that, we got going on drug discovery in a robust manner. We had 55 million in working capital to, 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 to build a portfolio and industrialize the single cell platform. Celgene was interested in both uh, industrializing the platform for their applications and also to, for us to build a uh, drug portfolio. And we elected to focus the, portfo the portfolio on epigenetic targets. And the rationale for this uh, was that some of these targets clearly maintain cancer stem cell viability, and also that there were a set of druggable targets that were timely in this space. Uh, we specifically focused on um, uh, uh, erasers, so-called erasers, and readers, um, namely KDMs and uh, BRD, uh, BRDs, um, with various target validation states to build value. Now, some of this work is starting to appear in the IP literature, but I'm going to, um, discretion is the better part of valor here, and I don't want to get in trouble with Celgene. So I'll just say uh, time passed and some undisclosed drug discovery magic uh, did occur. And three and a half years later, the company was acquired, all right, per plan. Um, and uh, this is a smaller crew. We had, I think, a total of 35 employees at acquisition point. Um, I seem to wear the same clothing. There I am in the black and beige. I'm not a slave to fashion. So here's a summary of the timeline for Quanacell, and there's an important point I wanted to make here beyond this timeline. So from, from financing, really robust financing, to acquisition close was less than four years. Um, this ended up being an attractive value proposition for all concerned. Celgene got what it's one out of the deal. The employees and um, founders actually enjoyed uh, unusual ownership as a result of the structure of the deal. Um, and the investors won out with a well over 10x return on their investment. And uh, what's at least as important to me um, is that there are now two compounds in the clinic. I can't describe what those are, but I'm very excited about them. And hopefully, there'll be some marketed drugs coming out of this portfolio with time. Okay. 
you're perhaps now seeing a theme in terms of how I judge success here, but Quanacell, which is now termed cell gene Quanacell research, is, uh, continues to this day to advance its uh, portfolio and technology platform post-acquisition as a part of cell gene um, uh, with a fair number of people here locally in San Diego. So we're now up to present, and I wanted to close with a brief um, picture into uh, what my colleagues and I are now spending time on, and that is primarily for me, Fount Therapeutics. So after um, completing my work with um, uh, Quanacell, uh, uh, I exited shortly after the acquisition. Um, I did a bit of reflection on what I was interested in doing next. And um, there were a lot of people interested in me running their biotechs. Um, uh, um, um, you get a reputation that you make people money and people want to make money uh, through you, all right? Um, but I, I elected to turn down a, a number of uh, attractive opportunities nonetheless. And uh, I thought about, um, um, did some soul searching, thought about what had been accomplished and what hadn't been accomplished. And one of the sources of pain for me were the inefficiencies associated with these acquisitions. And while, um, in fact, there were opportunities for jobs within a lot of these acquirers, the fact of the matter is that a lot of people have uh, a small, small company mindset and would like to stay in the small companies. Um, and continue to be productive in a small company setting. And so the question was, in part for me, how to solve for that um, so that any one acquisition didn't result in a disruption in the flow of people necessarily into the acquirer. Um, my co-founder and I, uh, Eric, Eric Murphy, um, um, st studied this problem and we did some benchmarking. And we found that there were a r relatively rare group of companies out there that were looking at trying to address this problem as well. One in the Boston area called Nimbus. Um, a few companies locally here, including Inception Sciences and um, Inhibrex, uh, were looking at different models for sustaining productivity but allowing for acquisition events to occur. Uh, um, and so uh, resting on the shoulders of others and trying to improve their models, we came up with Fount Therapeutics as a LLC, as a parent that would house uh, our employees. The notion was to create subsidiaries under Fount as biotechs, in essence, biotech C Corps, to have three of these going at steady state and progress from there. Uh, so the design is that each new co separately funded and therapeutic area focused to enable straightforward acquisition because large pharma and biotech like to pick themes to acquire that fit with their portfolios. The design is to put uh, three successful programs in each of these uh, companies. There's likely to be some attrition, but to have three successes come out of it with at least one of those programs advanced through clinical proof of concept prior to acquisition. And that each uh, new co, as it was transacted through an acquisition, would be replaced with a new company so that steady state would be maintained with three companies. And that the talent would seamlessly be redeployed. Some people might work on one or two of these at a time. You know, it would vary depending on the skill set, uh, et cetera, and our uh, capacity. So uh, it's nice to have that on an app, and the question is, can you enable this? And so this is a status report, and this is really new. We have no website, by the way. Um, uh, we've done no press releases on this. So I'm sharing something with you that's uh, uh, under the radar, all right? So we did indeed, with Wilson Sonsini's help, actually incorporate um, Fount Therapeutics LLC, the parent, in late 16. And in fact, we've incorporated our first three new co-subsidiaries. Um, they're called Kinate, Emanate, and Audere. Audere is from the Latin for the dare, in case you're curious. Um, and uh, unexpectedly, really, <clears throat> without putting huge amount of effort to it, we've attracted um, robust financing. Um, I think uh, the first two people we approached said, could we participate in this? And so we took in money uh, from them, which closed uh, in the first half of this year. And 
the way that the money was taken went in is directly in the three subsidiaries. Uh, and we actually have latitude as to how we distribute it across those companies to produce value. And the parent LLC is 100% owned by the um, employees and founders. Um, and so um, we're excited about that. It gives us enormous degrees of freedom. And in fact, we have control uh, even at the new co level uh, in terms of um, those entities. So uh, with that in mind, uh, uh, Eric and I have embarked on hiring talent. Um, and that's gone well. We have 100% acceptance rate. People seem to like uh, the model and the notion that they can manage a portfolio as an employee. We've established relationships with CROs because, of course, outsourcing is a, a component of its success in drug discovery. And we have uh, easily 30 or 40 folks now working for us externally. We have four drug discovery programs ongoing, spanning the first two new codes. Um, the third new co is laying in wait. We have financing for it, but we need to focus to be successful. We have three de novo programs uh, ongoing that we've started from scratch without any licensing. And we've licensed another uh, program from Sanford Burnham here locally. Uh, we've produced promising in vitro and in vivo data already for a subset of these programs and have, with Wilson Sonsini's IP group, actually Mike's group's help, um, filed our initial IP filings. So we're excited about this. Um, and uh, these are the talent involved. I've got two slides of this. Um, and I wanted to make a few points here. Um, the first is that these individuals are pretty much all people we've worked with before who've produced uh, successes at places like, um, for example, Quanacell and Cirrix and Takeda. Um, they're certified drug hunters. Some are younger, some are older. Uh, we're trying to build for the long term, so we need a diversity of age. Uh, we're planning for a multi-decade success here. It's ambitious, but that's, why not be ambitious, right? It's motivating. Um, uh, you know, we have the inventor of Tarceva, a marketed cancer drug. Um, uh, Noel there is an example of someone who's worked in large pharma and biotech and has touched multiple marketed drugs. Um, we have pioneers in translational me medicine, such as Eric Martin, who've worked at Plexicon and Ignita and other places. Um, um, and I'm excited about the team and how this is growing. Uh, uh, in addition to employees, you know, I'll highlight um, a few other elements here. We've built development into this immediately. You remember at Cirix, we, we, we ended up partnering with PPD in order to access development. In this case, it's a fun story for me. So uh, what happened with PPD's 50% stake in those diabetes assets, perhaps some of you might ask. Well, let me tell you the story behind that. Um, Takeda asked me to renegotiate their deal with them after I joined Takeda. They said, you know, 50% sharing is unacceptable. So I turned that into a royalty uh, deal, more of a traditional deal, which was very lucrative for PPD. The investors in PPD, which is CRO, didn't get the portfolio in those assets, though. And so PPD elected to spin out uh, that portfolio, including the um, potential uh, diabetes drug royalty stream into a separate company called Furyx, And that became a public company maybe about six years ago. And um, that team, including um, Gail McIntyre shown here, Laura uh, Bonifacio, and then Salish Patel on this slide, advanced a, a portfolio of assets and, uh, and, and used the royalties from the, the Cirrix diabetes drug, Takeda drug, to, to fund this operation. And they went from a $100 million market cap to a billion dollar plus market cap in three years on the strength of an IBS D compound that they took to NDA submission and was, uh, was the re resulted in an acquisition. And so um, we've elected to build the development team into Fount. And so these folks who um, uh, worked with me at Cirrix and I was on the board of Furyx are now participating here uh, with me and the team on our new endeavor. Um, and then just a shout out to, to UCSD, uh, your own Andy Lowy here at the Morris UCSD Cancer Center is an advisor for us. Um, uh, uh, you know, we are doing some oncology work. I won't tell you more than that, but that's an aspect of what we're doing, not surprising based on the talent map. And then in a blinded manner, I'll just share with you with some risk. Uh, this is laying all to bear here. Um, 
what we're planning to do. All right. And so the notion is to produce uh, three pipelines, two in parallel and a, set, and a third one coming up slightly behind that over time. Uh, and have a subset of these compounds go into the clinic and demonstrate proof of concept. At that point, we're modeling for acquisitions occurring and then um, new companies being funded um, uh, with these acquisitions occurring. And the hope is that this would be a sustainable ecosystem here in San Diego. Uh, perhaps the last point I wanted to make from this slide is we're open for business. And so for those of you who are entrepreneurial, and are perhaps doing drug discovery and have interesting programs that you think could be relevant for us. For each of our new codes, we're looking to seed at least one of those three or four arrows with an in-license program. And the Sanford, license, Sanford Burnham license is just the first example of many. So we're going to do a blend of what I call de novo and licensed work to build these portfolios. So I want to uh, complete with a few conclusions. Um, some take-home messages at a high level from my 25 years in industry. So these are some suggestions for those of you who want to embark on the biotech endeavor. I know not everyone in the audience uh, is keen on this, but perhaps a subset of you are. And the first suggestion I have is to focus on true value creation. All right, And for me, that's marketed drugs that help patients and strengthening that biotech ecosystem. And increasingly, my focus is on talent development. And I'm particularly interested in growing serial entrepreneurs because there's a dearth of them in industry still. And um, I'm very happy that the number of people I've been affiliated, especially since coming to San Diego, have gone on to start their own companies. And uh, you know, they're, they're, they're progressing those nicely. Vision and strategy matter, all right? Uh, and these need to be customized per biotech. Uh, based on sources of competitive advantage. And so uh, I gave you an example, I actually dwelled on this heavily in this lecture on the Cirex uh, recasting and, and, and how to use competitive advantage to turn around comp a company that frankly was ready to die. All right? And so um, that's an example of portfolio strategy, which is an element of overall strategy. These flow into goals as well that are concrete, measurable, and should be delivered on. A bit of a word on tech platforms. I've had a lot of experience with them. All right, uh, they can be valuable, but they also senesce. All right, and so if you're going to be a drug hunter, and this is a drug hunter series, you know, never lose sight of the fact that job one is creating drugs, and actually job two is creating drugs. And the platform should be at the service of producing the portfolio. Too many biotechs lose sight of that and overspend on their platforms at the cost of uh, the portfolio. Uh, next point I'd like to make is effective R&D is essential, but not sufficient. So I've been intentional in this talk in blending science and business development aspects, because both are critical to success. And you need to have talent on board that can do both in order to be successful in biotech. Um, that flows into the next comment here, which is success has many parents. It is a rare, rare exception that a company creates, develops, launches, and through the 20-year, potentially, patent life cycle, owns the product from a birth to death. I think that's probably a 1% event, All right, just to give you a feel for how rare it is. So success has many parents, and I've tried to hammer home to you that fact here with these case studies. All right, And so the corollary to that is effective collaboration is key. If you can't do that well, you're not going to succeed in producing marketed drugs. And the last one is a personal note, all right? And so um, I've done a lot of growing through this uh, 27 years. And my advice to you is continue to stretch yourself to grow, but branch out from a position of strength and never forget to touch home base. And for each of you, that definition of home base will be different. For me, if it isn't already evident to you, my home base is structure-based drug discovery, all right? and actually small molecule structure based drug discovery. I had one endeavor that I don't, don't describe here that involves biologics. I've returned home, and I'm a happier person for focusing there, all right? Uh, you know, and you have your own home base, but find that would be my uh, passionate advice to you. And with that comes passion. So I think I'm at, uh, I've got one last slide I want to share with you before I close here. 
and that's some acknowledgments. And I started to produce an eye chart, and I realized people wouldn't be able to read it, and I would probably offend some people by missing them. My memory is anything but perfect. And so um, what I'd like to do here is thank, offer a hearty thank you to all the Drug Hunter teammates I've had the pleasure to collaborate with over the years at Lilly, Aguron, Cirix, uh, Versant, PPD, Takeda, Ambrix, Quanacell, Celgene, Fount, um, and others. I'd also like to offer my sincere thanks to the various academic entrepreneurs I've had the pleasure of working with at institutions such as TSRI, GNF, which is a little bit of a tweener. I guess it's an institute, but they produce drugs. Um, UC Berkeley, Stanford, UC San Diego, and Sanford Burnham Preves um, that have helped position these companies for success. And last but not least, I want to dedicate this lecture to Marlis Hammond, uh, who was a master's level chemist working in my lab who first synthesized uh, Virocept in 1993. She recently passed away, and she's a good chemist. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, it, it's five, but why don't we make time for a few questions? And it, will you tell me what to do with my, I guess we should give the, the hand. Yeah, sure. Question. So let me. Uh, Oh, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so um, my question is, uh, what do you think is the microphone shall control it? Oh, OK. So uh, what do you think is uh, different uh, in, in the drug discovery process 25 years ago and right now? And uh, what do you think is causing those difference, like, for example, technology-wise or um, funding-wise or th those kind of things? Yeah, um, so what's different from when I started in industry um, in the drug discovery process? Um, there's a lot that's uh, changed. And, um, you know, I've gotten to witness, uh, just to give you a feel, I've been around for a while. So structure-based drug discovery was a novelty when I started. There were very, very few drugs that had been produced from that technique. Uh, ACE inhibitors, perhaps, and a few others, but that's come to the forefront, and I've enjoyed working in that space. It's become more predictable, and perhaps the majority or close to the majority of targets are enabled by that approach, and it's even spanning into GPCRs uh, with time. Uh, obviously, genomics have come up, and uh, I would say people have been a little short-sighted uh, or have been inaccurate in their predictions on at what rate the genome would be harnessed to produce drugs. I think there were a lot of deals done in the mid-90s when the genome was first published where people felt flip a switch and the drugs will appear. It's taken more than that. And you saw one of the endeavors I, I talked about where we went from uh, genomics to structural proteomics with the hope we could get to drugs. And in that case study, I had to redirect back to more tried and true methods for producing drugs because it, uh, structural proteomics wasn't quite ready for prime time at that time. Things continue to progress. And so I think the harnessing of the genome is becoming more and more a reality. I think that data for subsetting patients is a remarkable advance, uh, especially in the oncology space. And that is translating into other therapeutic areas. I just think oncology is on the vanguard, and it's only a matter of time before it translates into other areas. So this notion of being able to subset patients and have more effective therapies in, in, in a rationally designed manner is very exciting to me. I didn't have that opportunity in 1990. That just was almost impossible to conceive of. There are many other things I could list, but those are off the cuff a few things that are definitely changing. And it's interesting to predict the rates in which technology advances are bleeding edge right now and cutting edge. I think one of the jobs for people in the industry is to find out what's pragmatically useful within the time frame in which you have money and funding to succeed, all right? And I've tried to solve that puzzle over my career, and I think it's an interesting nut to try and crack. Very nice uh, seminar presentation. I was wondering if you could provide some more flavor to your current targets or therapeutic areas you're pursuing. And you're still pretty aggressive in your accomplishing uh, IND phase uh, around like within two years. So I was wondering if you're still 
subscribe to the idea of pursuing validated targets versus doing something riskier? Yeah, um, so we're in a very uh, vulnerable state to disclose portfolio details at this point, so I'm going to plead the fifth on this, but I will give you a few hints. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, you know, I'm working with a, actually a whole um, slew of certified drug hunters in this company, all right? And we recognize the value of managing a portfolio and portfolios within each company. So it's logical to think of a, a, an appropriate diversity of target validation state within these companies. And, uh, and we're using a blended approach. Um, and then I've, I've dropped a hint, and it shouldn't be a big surprise based on the hires and the consultants that we're doing some oncology work. Uh, we're also working outside of oncology, but we're not ready to disclose that therapeutic area. And um, you know, part of a sustainable enterprise for uh, Eric and I as co-founders of this enterprise is building sufficient therapeutic area breadth to allow for multi-decade sustainability. And so uh, we'll, we'll, there'll be more than one therapeutic area pursued as a result within the, the overall found enterprise. And we've done some hiring uh, already to try and build in some diversity of expertise. One last question. It was interesting to see how quickly could you could move from synthesis of compound or identify and identification of gene to launching a drug. What have you seen, because you exited always to Big Pharma, what does Big Pharma do wrong that they cannot achieve that same kind of speed that you were able to, to achieve? I, I would say I've seen examples of them achieving that sort of speed. And so it's heterogeneous. So uh, they're incredibly capable groups within large pharma. Um, I think one of the challenges I've seen in large pharma, and I've witnessed this uh, both in-house and vicariously, and, and one of the key lessons I learned, let me go back to the Lilly example, all right, because this is a, a teachable moment. Um, the primary source of attrition in pharma is not technical. It is non-technical, all right? And uh, one of the inefficiencies that I see in um, pharma, uh, and I think this occurs a little bit more than biotech, is uh, a bit of changing mind on franchises and portfolio strategy, and for that matter, target validation state uh, strategy. If you change too frequently, you lose momentum, and um, you don't produce candidates with the same efficiency. And so uh, getting these themes right, having a maniacal focus to succeed, and not being burdened by legacy, you know, starting afresh is, a, is an advantage. Um, uh, if you have the right talent on board, you can, a fresh start is, is a net positive, in my opinion. And then focusing it appropriately while still allowing for a little bit of nimbleness is a potential advantage in biotech. And in fact, some of the pharmas, GSK and others, have tried to create kind of micro environments within these large companies to mimic that. So there's some very bright people in pharma, um, and they're trying to succeed. Uh, drug discovery and development is very hard. Um, and so uh, I, I see examples across large and small of success here. I think we should, oh well, we'll sneak one more in. Thank you, very inspiring talk. I had a question, you mentioned that about 70% of the uh, successful drugs come from clinically validated targets. Mm -hmm. I assume that there's some discrimination between different therapeutic areas where these numbers might change, I don't know, maybe between CNS diseases or oncology. Can, can you outline again a little bit more into detail for that? Yeah, it's, it's been a while since I've done a thorough analysis myself on it. Um, and so I'm dealing with a little bit of dated information, but. In fact, there is, uh, there, there are, uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I've done some, you know, this just brings back some thoughts. So the, the first comment I'd make is it does vary by therapeutic area. And in certain therapeutic areas, historically, and it gets to market size, they may not support multiple launch drugs. Uh, traditionally, it used to be in oncology, it was viewed as, you know, you either got there first or you lost. It's no longer the case. Um, and this whole patient subsetting strategies uh, offer new life to multiple drugs for a mechanism. But I'd say there is some variation from therapeutic area to therapeutic area, and one of the variables there is market size in terms of what the market could support, all right? Um, and I won't go into Lily's story. I can talk with you offline about it. That's a long story, but there's an interesting analysis I did when I was there. But it's, it's a great question. All right. So there's a... Um 
a reception. There are some freshmen in the uh, lobby, and I'm hoping that Stephen and some of the folks from WSGR will stay around in case, especially students and postdocs, want to talk to them about these kinds of directions or if people want to talk science. So let's thank Stephen again. Thank you.